Hi, and welcome to NET203, Demystifying Data Transfer in AWS. I'm Josh Heller, part of the EC2 networking team. Thanks for spending your time with me today. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about data transfer on AWS. We're going to cover a range of topics today. We'll begin by discussing the AWS global network. It's easiest to understand data transfer once you understand how AWS operates our global network. Next, we'll talk about data transfer itself. There's different kinds of data transfer depending on how you're building on AWS, and it's important to understand how it works across the parts of our cloud. From there, we'll spend some time discussing tools and techniques that you can use to understand data transfer in your accounts. Finally, we'll go over some tips we'd like to share on how to optimize how your workloads use data transfer. We've built some best practices on this subject that might help you save money and improve how your applications run on AWS. With that, let's get started by discussing what data transfer is and how it's incurred. To do that, we'll start by looking at the AWS global network and its building blocks. AWS operates the largest global infrastructure footprint of any cloud provider, and we're continually expanding that footprint to help customers deliver better end user experience, expand their global reach, and meet various regulatory requirements. Currently, our network is made up of 24 regions across the globe. Each of our regions is made up of at least two availability zones and usually more than that. Most of the discussion today will focus around availability zones and regions, and we'll discuss regions and availability zones in more detail in just a few minutes. In addition to regions and AZs, to bring AWS services as close to users as possible, our global network also includes more than 210 edge locations, AWS local zones, and AWS wavelength zones. Now, let's turn and take a closer look at some of the building blocks of our network. The last slide, discuss some of the primary concepts when it comes to AWS networking. Let's expand on that and look at a few of these concepts in more detail. Fundamentally, data transfer happens when you cross boundaries in the network. We'll spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about the kind of activities that drive network communication across those boundaries and how that communication is metered or measured. Let's look a little more at the details of our networking building blocks. We'll start at the top and work our way down. Let's start with regions. The AWS cloud is made up of 24 regions. On the slide, I'm only showing a pair of regions. These could be any two regions in North America, Europe, Asia, et cetera, anywhere we've built regions around the globe. Each of these regions is part of the AWS backbone, a fully redundant global network that's linked by high speed, low latency fiber optics. Within each region, there are at least two availability zones or AZs. Each region consists of two or more isolated and physically separated availability zones. Each of these AZs can represent multiple separate data centers, and each AZ has its own infrastructure, such as power, cooling, and security. They're connected with each other using re redundant, ultra-low latency connections. They're physically separated from each other, so the regions they make up are protected from issues like power outages and natural disasters, but the AZs are still close enough to support synchronous replication scenarios for your workloads. AZs are the logical unit across which to build application partitions. We'll discuss this more later, but we suggest building partitions of your applications across multiple availability zones to help drive uptime and reliability. The last building block we'll discuss is Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC. VPCs are the environments where many AWS resources are deployed. They're regionally scoped. That means VPCs are deployed within a given region and cross between multiple availability zones within that region. VPCs are logically isolated parts of the AWS cloud where you can create a virtual network configuration that you define. This includes IP addressing, subnet strategy, route tables, and more. Now that we've learned about the building blocks that control where data transfer happens, we'll look at some examples of how data transfer occurs when workloads are deployed on AWS. When we began this slide, we started at the top, the AWS cloud, and worked our way down to the VPC. To better understand data transfer, we'll start at the bottom and work our way back up. We'll begin with data transfer behavior in a single availability zone. Here's the diagram we're gonna work with. We'll talk about and build out a few different scenarios on this diagram, and then we'll expand the diagram to cover wider parts of the AWS cloud in subsequent slides. But to start, here we're looking at a single region and a single AZ within that region. In that region, we've deployed two VPCs in our example. Remember, 
VPCs are logical networks with one or more subnets, a routing table, etc. In the first VPC on top, we have two EC2 instances, each with a private IP address. The VPC on the bottom also has a couple of EC2 instances, but in the case of that VPC, the instances are using elastic IP or public IP addresses. Let's start by talking about the two instances in the top VPC. Now, we see the two instances in that top VPC communicating with each other over the network. This is a super common operation. In this case, we call this intra-AZ data transfer. Within a single AZ, between two instances in the same VPC that are using private IP addresses, there's no charge for that. Now, this is a good time to stop and direct everyone to the bottom of the slide. There's a lot of details to data transfer pricing, and those details and current prices can always be found on the page below. It's a good idea to check that page for the most recent pricing. This link and some others that I'll share during this presentation are all available on a single slide at the end of today's presentation. So we just talked about two instances in a VPC that communicate with private IP addresses. What happens if we're not using private IPs? Well, let's look at the example that I just built. Here, we're in our second VPC, and we have two instances that have elastic IP addresses attached to them. To make sure everyone is on the same page, an elastic IP or EIP is a public IPv4 address. It's reachable from the internet. Those can be part of Amazon's pool of addresses, or they can come from you if you choose to bring your own IP address pool to AWS. When an instance communicates using an EIP or any public IP address, there's a cost to that. It's charged per gigabyte, and even when you're communicating within a single VPC in a single AZ, so while there may be good reasons for using public IP addresses, if you don't need to use them, it's best to use private IP addresses when possible. The last scenario we'll look at on this slide is how data transfer works when you're communicating between two VPCs. VPCs can be connected together through a process called peering. They can either be peered directly or connected via AWS Transit Gateway. In either case, VPC peering or Transit Gateway there's a charge for instances communicating across the VPC boundary. In the case of direct peering, which is shown here, there's a simple per gigabyte charge for communication in each direction, inbound and outbound. Now that we've discussed data transfer within a single availability zone, let's zoom out and take a look at how data transfer works between multiple AZs. You'll see we've added some elements to the diagram from the previous slide. We're still working within a single region, but now, we're building across two availability zones. As we discussed earlier, a single VPC spans across all the AZs in a given region. Each of those AZs has one or more IP subnets associated with each VPC that's present in the availability zone. In the diagram we have here, you'll see we have four instances in the top VPC. The instances in each AZ share a common subnet. Like we did in the previous slide, let's start by talking about the VPC at the top of the diagram. Here. We're looking at an EC2 instance in one AZ, talk to an EC2 instance in the other AZ. They're both part of the same AZ, but they've crossed that AZ boundary. As they cross that boundary, they incur inter-AZ data transfer usage. We also call that intra-region data transfer. That's charged in both directions on a per gigabyte basis. We'll discuss this topic a little later in the presentation, but reducing your application communication across AZ boundaries is an important technique to reduce data transfer. Try to build your application so the communication is contained within a single availability zone, but then create multiple partitions of that application across AZs to provide the redundancy your application needs. Next, let's look at what happens with multiple VPCs. Here, an instance in the bottom VPC is communicating with an instance in a different VPC. Remember from our previous slide that this is accomplished through things like VPC peering. Like the previous slide, anytime you communicate between two VPCs in a region, there is a per gigabyte charge for that, regardless of if the traffic crosses AZ boundaries like it does in this slide, or if it stays within a single availability zone as in the last slide. Both scenarios incur cost. Next, let's take a look at the top of the diagram. The purple icon at the top of the diagram represents an application load balancer, or ALB. Many of our customers use ALBs in their AWS deployments. Load balancers, like ALB, are useful to share load across multiple backend targets. Remember, usually communication between instances in different availability zones incurs a charge. However, data transferred in and out of ALB or the classic load balancer within a single region from EC2 is free. 
Using an ALB or classic load balancer can be a great way to minimize the impact of intra-region data transfer. We'll touch on this again later in the presentation. However, it's important to note that it's only free using private IP addresses. EIPs, just like we covered on the previous slide, incur cost. ALB and classic load balancer also incur costs of their own. So make sure you check out the pricing page for Elastic Load Balancing for all the details. Finally, you'll also notice that I included a group of AWS services that exist as regional endpoints on the lower, on the lower right of the slide. For services like Amazon S3, DynamoDB, all the ones I've listed on the slide, there's no charge for data transferred between those services and EC2 instances in the same region. Let's continue zooming out. We've looked at data transfer within a single AZ. We've looked at data transfer within a single region. Now let's look at data transfer between multiple AWS regions. As you can see, we've built our diagram again. For readability, I've simplified the diagram a little bit. We still have the core building blocks of VPCs, AZs, and regions, but where the previous slides looked only at a single region, now we're gonna look at data transfer when we leave a region. First, let's see what happens when an EC2 instance in one region communicates with an EC2 instance in another region. We call this inter-region data transfer, and there's a per gigabyte charge associated with that. It's important to note we only charge for the outbound side of communication between two regions. So if the instance on the left, the one with a 10.0.0.11 IP address, communicates with the instance on the right, IP 10.0.1.11, the charge is assessed at the region on the left where the communication initiated. Conversely, when 10.0.1.11 replies to 10.0.0.11, then the charge is assessed at the region on the right. This is important because the per gigabyte cost varies by region. As a reminder, it's always best to check the pricing link at the bottom of this slide for the most recent pricing. Another common scenario arises when customers are using Amazon CloudFront. CloudFront is Amazon CDN, or Content Delivery Network. CloudFront's available at more than 225 edge locations that connect to our global backbone. CloudFront is great for distributing content close to your end users. CloudFront works by caching data from sources like EC2, S3, and more into those edge pops. When you're populating data from an AWS source to CloudFront, an operation we call origin fetch, there's no charge for data transfer. However, for data that gets sent from CloudFront Edge locations back to EC2 or other origin types, there is a per gigabyte charge assessed. Take a look at the CloudFront website for more detail and current pricing. Finally, AWS PrivateLink provides connectivity between VPCs and services hosted on AWS. It uses private endpoints to connect services between different accounts and VPCs. In the diagram here, we show an EC2 instance in a given region communicating with a private link endpoint in the same region. Because the endpoint is in the same region as the EC2 instance, there isn't any inter-region data transfer charge. However, private link charges, data, private link charges including data processing still apply. Visit the private link page to learn more about private link and its pricing model. The last few slides have focused on how data moves around the AWS network within an availability zone, within a region, and between regions. The next slide, we're gonna take a look at how data transfer works when it leaves the AWS cloud. Most customers will, at some point, need to get data into or out of the AWS cloud. There are a few different ways to do that, and we're gonna discuss the data transfer impact those methods on this slide. We've been progressively zooming out on the network. And in this final slide, in this section, we're looking at the AWS cloud overall in the diagram. We see it next to both a corporate data center or COLA facility, as well as the internet. No, the diagram has been simplified again. We're still working with those same building blocks, but we're only looking at a single region in this particular example. Let's start by talking about getting data to and from data centers or other private COLA facilities. Many customers use AWS Direct Connect for this purpose. In the diagram above, you see data coming into AWS via Direct Connect, as well as data leaving AWS via Direct Connect. There is no data transfer charge for data coming into AWS via Direct Connect. That's data being sent from your data center or COLA facility into the AWS cloud. On the other hand, Data egressing AWS over Direct Connect has a data processing charge that's metered per gigabyte. The cost of outbound data varies by region and Direct Connect location. 
There's a full list of Direct Connect pricing available online. I'd encourage you to check there for the latest details. When you use Direct Connect, there's also a port charge that applies based on the port capacity. Again, specific details can be found on the Direct Connect website. The other primary way to get data in and out of AWS is over the internet. Like Direct Connect, data transfer into AWS from the internet is free of charge. Data that leaves AWS to go out to the internet is charged on a per gigabyte basis. You may hear this referred to as data transfer out or DTO. Those charges vary based on the region where the data transfer out initiates. There's a complete list of these charges by region at the link in the bottom of the slide. It's important to understand what's driving your data transfer out to the internet. We'll discuss some ways to do this in the next section, but if you find you're using data transfer out for serving a lot of content to the internet, you might want to investigate using CloudFront instead. CloudFront still incurs data transfer costs for servicing content to the internet, but it may be available at a lower rate. Plus, you get the benefit of a better user experience by, service, by servicing content from AWS's many edge locations. Specific CloudFront pricing is available on the CloudFront website, or check with your AWS team for some more information and help figure out if CloudFront's a good fit for your workload. Over the last handful of slides, we spent some time understanding the AWS global network and how data transfer fits into our networking building blocks. In the next section, we'll look at how to manage data transfer in your environment. Managing data transfer in your environment comes down to three areas. First, we'll look at ways to help estimate the cost impact of data transfer on your projects. Next, we'll discuss some tools that are available to help you measure and visualize your data transfer consumption. In the final portion of the presentation today, we'll look at a few tips you can use in your environment to help optimize data transfer for your workloads. Let's get started by talking about estimating your data transfer costs. The best place to start if you want to estimate the cost impact that data transfer will have on a workload is the AWS pricing calculator. We've included a link at the top of the slide, but it's easy to remember at calculator.aws. The AWS pricing calculator lets you create price estimates for a variety of AWS services. You can create estimates for a specific project and add all the services into that estimate that are needed. To use the calculator to estimate data transfer costs, first, open up the calculator and create a new estimate. Once you've created a new estimate, you'll be able to select from a large list of AWS services. Either scroll through or use the search bar to find Amazon Virtual Private Cloud. EC2 data transfer, what most of this presentation is focused on, is part of the VPC service category. Click configure on the VPC service listing and choose the data transfer option at the top. You'll, sense, you'll then see the options presented in the picture. It's going to look similar to the picture on the right of the slide. Make sure you select the region that you're working with. Remember, data transfer charges vary by region, so you need to pick the correct region so that you get the most accurate price estimate. Within the calculator, you'll see options to configure the type of data transfer, the amount you plan on transferring, and then you'll be able to add those inputs along with other types of data transfer. At the bottom, you'll see an estimated monthly cost that can then be added to your overall project estimate so you have an idea of the potential overall impact of data transfer. You can also use the calculator to estimate the cost for other related services that we've discussed. The VPC service and the pricing, ca the pricing calculator also includes pricing guidance for Transit Gateway and AWS Private Link. The calculator is a great tool for estimating potential charges, but it's equally important to be able to understand the impact data transfers already having in your environment. The next few slides will guide you through some simple steps to visualize data transfer in your accounts. Data transfer is included as part of your AWS bill, but it can be difficult to understand exactly what type of data transfer charges are represented and where they apply to your organization's use of AWS. To make it easier to understand the impact data transfer is having in your environment, you can use Cost Explorer to visualize your data transfer spend. Cost Explorer is available for customers to visualize and manage their AWS cost and usage. We'll spend the next few minutes discussing how you can use Cost Explorer to understand the costs that are specific to data transfer. Cost Explorer can be found in the Billing and Cost Management Console. The first step to analyzing your data transfer costs with Cost Explorer is to configure cost allocation tags. While not required, tags are a great tool to help you label resources with metadata that's relevant to your business. We'll use these tags to help filter the cost information that you see in Cost Explorer. Tags are associated with AWS resources such as EC2 instances. You can create tags that associate a given AWS resource with the environment you're using it in, such as dev, test, prod. 
the application that that particular resource supports or the organization or BU that's responsible for it. Here, I've included a screenshot that shows some sample tags that I've configured on one of my instances. In this case, the instance is running the dev environment for my order to cash app, which happens to be owned by the finance team. I've used these tags and values just as an example. You can use different ones that make sense for your business. If you'd like to learn more, AWS has published best practices for using tags for all kinds of purposes, including cost management. Once you've tagged your AWS resources, those tags will be available in Cost Explorer to help create sophisticated, filtered views of your AWS cost data by the dimensions of your tags. So next, let's look at how to construct those filters to focus on data transfer. To create rich reports of your data transfer use on AWS, you'll create filters for three areas in Cost Explorer. First, you'll create service filters. Service filters help us look only at the AWS services that drive, AWS, uh, that drive data transfer. This reduces the amount of data we need to look at. When we're analyzing data transfer, we'll usually focus on two services, EC2 instances and EC2 ELB. Most data transfer will be driven by those two services. Next, we'll move to create usage filters. The various items on your bill have different types of usage associated with them that drive costs for a given AWS resource. When we're looking to analyze data transfer, there are three usage types to focus on. Each of these usage types corresponds to the data transfer types that we reviewed earlier in the presentation. First, you look for EC2 data transfer inter AZ. This type, if you remember back to earlier in the presentation, covers data transferred between two availability zones in the same region. Next, find EC2 data transfer internet out. This is all the data transfer that egresses AWS back out to the internet. Finally, look for EC2 data transfer region to region out. This covers data transfer between AWS regions. Remember, we only charge for data from an instance leaving a region, which is why we leave the inside of region to region unchecked. As you get comfortable using Cost Explorer to manage your data transfer spend, you can try experimenting with other service types and usage types to get an even more holistic view of data transfer. The last step in our filter creation is to use the tags we created in the previous slide. Here, you'll pick a tag category, such as environment, and choose the values you want to filter on. This last step is how you'll be able to zero in on data transfer and how it really affects certain parts of your business, whether it's by business unit, application environment, or any other important dimension to you. Once you've configured your filters, you can apply them and start to visualize your spend. Now that you've filtered appropriately on services, usage types, and your tags, you'll be able to get a visual perspective of your data transfer spend. Use this data to find hotspots and discover new insights into how your organization is consuming data transfer on AWS. You can use these views to see data transfer over time, grouped by region or availability zone, and get details on how the usage of data transfer maps to your organization's use of AWS. The steps we just walked through are taken from a blog that we've published to help guide you through this process step by step. The link is available at the bottom of the slide and it's a great resource to get started with Cost Explorer and data transfer. While we've found that this blog is helpful to most of our customers, there's a few more resources I'd like to share around managing your data transfer on AWS. First, we've heard that some customers want more options in how they visualize data transfer on AWS. For those customers, you can use the data from the AWS cost and usage report to create dashboards and many popular analytic tools. To help customers get started, we've published guidance on how to use Amazon Athena and Amazon QuickSight to ingest the cost and usage report and then build dashboards using that data. Step-by-step -step guidance for creating the Athena views and QuickSight configuration is available at the link in the first column. The guidance in that blog will also help customers that want to use other analytic tools to manage their spend. It's important to note that additional charges may apply to using things like Amazon Athena and QuickSight. While well, Cost Explorer and QuickSight options are great at giving you insight into where data transfer is happening in your environment, some customers want to understand data transfer even more deeply. For example, you can use Cost Explorer to discover the amount of data transfer linked to a given AWS resource. But if you want to learn more about why that data transfer is happening, you may need to investigate at the network level. To solve that, I'd encourage customers to look at VPC flow logs. VPC flow logs can give you rich data about the network communication by a VPC resource, such as an EC2 instance.
The flow log will tell you about the resource, about the source and destination of the network flow, as well as port and protocol information. This often helps you figure out why a given resource is driving a particular type of data transfer. Flow logs can be published at CloudWatch or S3, and then used in many popular analytic or visualization tools. As with the first example, usage charges may apply. Finally, AWS is fortunate to have many great partners. Some of our partners have built tools to help our joint customers more effectively manage data transfer. I've highlighted just a couple of those partners here. If you think you could benefit from a partner to help manage data transfer, I'd encourage you to take a look at the cost management partners on the AWS marketplace. They can help not only visualize your AWS spend, but in some cases offer tips for optimizing that spend as well. Speaking of optimization, the final part of today's presentation focuses on tips that we found help our customers better utilize data transfer on AWS. We're going to cover three different ways to minimize the impact of data transfer. These methods and others like them are all part of AWS's well-architected program. The well-architected principles offer our customers guidance on how to build secure, performant, and efficient services on AWS. Well-architected includes a wide range of guidance for our customers, including recommendations on data transfer, as well as cost optimization. I'd encourage you to look more at the well-architected program by visiting the link on the page. Our first tip is around data transfer out to the internet. As we discussed earlier, data to the internet can go directly from EC2 instances out to the internet, or you can leverage CloudFront to serve content to your users. There's a few reasons to evaluate the use of CloudFront for your workloads. First, while both CloudFront and traditional data transfer out charge on a per gigabyte basis, most customers will see cost savings by using Amazon CloudFront. Prices for both services vary by region, so I'd encourage you to check the website for the most current pricing information. CloudFront's also notable because it doesn't charge for origin fetch operations. If you recall, origin fetch is the process of seeding the CloudFront locations with your content. When the, con when the origin is an AWS service like EC2, there is no data transfer charge between those AWS services and CloudFront. This is only available with CloudFront. Other CDN solutions may incur data transfer charges between the origin and the CDN locations. Beyond cost, there's other reasons to look at CloudFront to serve content to customers. With its placement at the edge of the AWS network, your data is served closer to your customers and often, often offers a better customer experience. CDNs such as CloudFront aren't a fit for every workload, uh, but it's often a great fit for customers that are trying to serve content to a geographically dispersed set of users. Next, let's take a look at a recommendation around application design. Earlier in the presentation, we discussed the behavior of data transfer when it crosses availability zone boundaries. This inter-AZ data transfer within a region is charged on a per gigabyte basis. For customers who want to minimize the amount of inter-AZ data transfer, start by looking at how your applications are built within an availability zone. Using AZs is critical to building a reliable application. Remember, AWS AZs are built to self-contained entities within a region. AZs don't share common infrastructure like power, cooling, or facilities with each other. In fact, they're intentionally spread out to isolate the impact of a power outage or natural disaster. So as you build applications on AWS, it's important to use availability zones to create partitions of your applications. Part of that partitioning process should be to ensure that you're isolating a given cell of your application within a single AZ. Then replicate that deployment to one or more additional AZs. When you're done, you'll have redundant deployments of your application across multiple AZs, ensuring better reliability for your workload. An additional benefit to architecting your applications this way is it will minimize the amount of data transfer between different AZs. Most of the network chatter between the instances running your applications will be isolated to individual availability zones. And if you recall, communication between EC2 instances in a VPC within a single AZ is free of charge if you're using private IP addresses. Even when you've deployed your application, using those best practices, you may need to persist data between the AZ-based partitions of your application. In that case, you may want to consider AWS managed data services such as Aurora, DynamoDB, etc. Those services are regionally based, not within an availability zone. So as your EC2 instances communicate with them, you won't incur additional data transfer charges and still maintain a regional data store. Even with those best practices, you may find occasions where communicating between two AZs is necessary. In those cases, you may wish to consider using an application load balancer or classic load balancer. 
if the load balancer is required. Data transferred between EC2 instances in either an ALB or CLB is free within a re given region as long as you're using private IP addresses. Of course, ALB and CLB usage charges still apply. An example where this might be useful is if you have an instance running in one AZ that needs to communicate with a fleet of instances supporting a web service in a different AZ. It might not make sense to duplicate that service fleet in the first AZ. In that case, you could load balance the destination service behind an application load balancer. Using the ALB helps ensure that your, app, that your web service stays highly available because it's running on a number of instances. And it also helps negate potential inter-AZ data, data transfer charges for requests within the region. When data transfer between AZs is necessary, ALB and CLB may help defray inter-AZ data transfer charges. Over the last 30 minutes, we got the opportunity to dive into the details about how the AWS Global Network is built, what data transfer is, and where it happens on the network, as well as some different tools and techniques that are available to help you see the impact that data transfer has on your use of AWS. Finally, we talked about some various techniques that you can use to minimize the impact of data transfer cost. Before we close, I've compiled a list of the links that I've mentioned throughout this presentation. You may find these useful to learn more about how to manage data transfer in your environment. With that, thank you so much for your time today. Again, I'm Josh Heller. My email address is on the slide, and I'd genuinely love to hear your feedback and questions. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Finally, please complete your session survey. We get better based on your feedback. Thanks again, and enjoy reInvent.